What's bored gamifying my emergency department experience? My name is Jeff. This is How It's Med, specifically Med Tech Talks, and we're chatting with Dr. Teresa Chan. Dr. Chan, how are you doing? Hello, how are you doing? Uh, I, I'm, I'm just debating whether or not that was at all a sufficient intro to introduce the sheer scope of what you've done. Oh, it's fine. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't only just do one thing, so it's hard to encapsulate me. I think it frustrates some people sometimes, you know, we like to file everybody under, you know, one or two little widgets sometimes in our brain, but, um, I'm trying to defy that. So I'm just trying to be a polymath. I, I think that's, that's, that's probably a, a good way to summarize what this conversation is going to be about, but, um, you, just off the air, we had talked a little bit about how you like to be addressed. It's Teresa T Chan. Yeah. Yeah. T and like my first initial and then Chan. So T Chan. All right. That's what people call me. All right. Yeah. Okay. So without further ado, we'll, we'll just jump right in. I think the, the usual question that we start off these conversations with is because quite a few of our interviewees are, uh, physicians. Uh -huh. How, why did you get interested in medicine? Um, I'm pretty sure it was brainwashing. My dad's a doc. Um, and so, uh, you know, when, when you, when you round on weekends with your dad and the nurses feed you cookies at the nursing station while he, you know, like, uh, goes to see his patients and, you know, I think you get a positive opinion of what healthcare can be uh, when you spend your uh, summers filing files and taking care of the office because the family business. I think you kind of get uh, brought into a world where um, healthcare is part of who you are, right? I, I mean, I think that when you have a parent who is a physician, you start to see the world the way that they do, right? Mm. Uh, engineers, physicians, uh, consultants often um, end up probably raising kids that see the world as fixable, as changeable, as yeah. something that we're supposed to stand up and help others solve. Um, and I think that that is so fundamental to who you become. Mm -hmm. It's not a surprise that my um, parents have two uh, women physicians that they've raised and a son who has gone into business to solve problems, <laughs> that. you know? So I think that that's what happens is, uh, is a good part of that. I, I did have, you know, a fit of, um, uh, indecision at some point yeah. and decided that maybe I didn't want to be a physician. And so I did explore going to teacher's college and things like mm. that. Um, I do not regret doing that because that has opened up a huge part of my life. Um, mm -hmm. and is the reason why I do both um, medicine and medical education now. So you, you, you kind of mentioned that a little bit at the side and my cat's just creeping right here. So I apologize if it creeps right in. His name is uh, yes. goose. He's a regular mm -hmm. guest. Um, but, um, essentially like what motivated you to pursue that you could say like side quest of education at a teacher's college first, was there any like particular sparking moment? Yeah, I don't think it was a sparking moment, but I think it was a realization during my med school interviews, the first time I applied, um, that I felt like a bit of an imposter, um, in the room when people asked me why I wanted to do medicine mm. and I hadn't done the introspection. I hadn't done the deep work I needed to do about myself in order to really understand my own motivations. It just felt right. Yeah. And you know how sometimes, um, sometimes when it may be right, um, but sometimes if you can't articulate why that is. Um, it's hard, right? Sometimes you just know that that's the right color, but, um, an interior decorator should be able to explain to you with color theory, why these two colors go together and why two other colors might not go together. Yeah. Um, but there's a difference between someone who intuitively knows design and has a good eye and someone who has the technical expertise of understanding. I think I wasn't a technical expert about myself yet. I, I needed to do that introspection. Now, teacher's college has a way of doing that. <laughs> Anyone that's ever done an education degree realizes that, especially at the one that I did, which is at, which is at U of T, they, they do actually ask you to think very, very introspectively about who you are so that you can start to begin a professional identity formation that, is, that, that accentuates um, who uh, you're going to be as a, uh, as a teacher. Right. And so a big part of the journey that I went through was that I thought very deeply about what my values were, uh, my axiology people would say like, and, and what, and how I thought, saw the world and that changed my perspective mm -hmm. and allowed me to then 
actually the next year, better articulate why I wanted to be a physician actually. Mm -hmm. And it didn't mean that I wasn't going to do education because lo and behold, I do both um, at a very high level now, but it's uh, one, of, one of those things where I think I needed um, to be guided through that thinking. Mm -hmm. Did you, I guess, did you ever get to actually teach um, outside of the medical context before med school or was medical education kind of a one year thing that you did before reapplying to med school? Uh, it was not medical education. I did my bachelor's of education gotcha. in, um, um, intermediate senior, um, high school education, right? Yeah. So biochemistry and, um, uh, science. And so I, I did a teacher's college is, uh, one half theoretical and one half practical, right? Mm. So I had two embedded pro practica gotcha. where I would just show up, do lesson plans, teach as a student teacher. I don't know if you ever had student teachers. When I did. You were at... They were my favorite yeah, teachers. So that's what I did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess, were there any particular moments that stood out to you during your practica overall that, you know, taught you lessons, um, that you still apply today as part of your med ed work? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think that education is education. So whether you're teaching, um, a remedial science class for people who just have to get their grade 10 science in order to pass high school for the sixth time, or you're teaching a med student who doesn't quite get what's going on. I think it's about learner centeredness. Mm -hmm. It's about knowing what your learners understand, um, and then giving them the thing that they need to go further. What is learner centeredness? Because I think that's a topic I want to delve a little bit into before we delve into more of your other work, because I think it pertains quite a bit to it. I mean, in my education so far, or my experience with medical education, a lot of it has just been like fire hosing, like facts at students. And it hasn't mm -hmm. been particularly learner centered apart from times when we're able to work one on one with a sim table at, uh, in the cadaver lab or one-on-one -on -one right. with an instructor in clinical settings when even that's yeah. fairly rare. So what is learner centeredness and why isn't it common in medicine uh, or is it? I think it's more common than you're recalling. Okay. Cause I think that a lot of the time the learner centeredness isn't in your big classrooms. Like you said, it's in those other experiences. It's in someone who tailors exactly how you might think about a case gotcha. in a clinical setting. You might not see that as teaching or learner centeredness. You might just say, oh, my attending just didn't like the way I presented my case. And I think that we as teachers need to do a better job at taking that. But sometimes some of our teachers, again, they're intuitive teachers, they're talented, but sometimes they haven't actually had the advanced training mm -hmm. to be able to know what they're doing is actually a very scaffolded learner centered activity. Yeah. And so it's not very, um, often that people will have both of those things. It's why I've gone on to actually focus a big part of my career right now on teacher training, faculty development, and, um, develop people as educators so that they can actually have that power of insight. Um, and the power of language really to be able to articulate what, what they are that they're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, let's drop it back to that interior designer, right? Um, design school is important, right? Because in order to have the training to be able to do the job, um, you need the practical, you need the theoretical, and then you need to be able to interlace those two. Same thing happens with education, uh, whether it's at the bedside, mm -hmm. uh, with a learner, right? Where you're customizing things because you're asking them, you know, people talk about pimping, which I don't like the term, but you know, you get a whole bunch of buzz questions and learners feel like they're just being, you know, like interrogated. And yeah. yet what the teacher is trying to understand is that they're trying to understand where you, where you are, yeah. because it's not like we run, you don't run around like a video game with a score with HP points over your head, right? I like wish. that's not, I that's not what we do. <laughs> All right, because if I could, then that would be amazing because we kind of AR and just see where you are in medical training, but your strengths and weaknesses are in a glance, right? But it's more like a video game where you know your HP points, mm. but you have no idea what everyone else's H HP points are. So hit HP points are hit points. And that would be like, just for the readers. For all our non-gamers. Non-gamers, right? Um, the idea would be that sometimes you run around not really knowing who you're talking to. And so, um. You know, it's always embarrassing when you find out your learner was, you know, a PhD in physiology and, uh, you've just been t asking them questions about physiology and they are nailing every question and you're like, oh, 
you seem to know a lot about this. Oh yeah, I did my PhD in uh, physiology and uh, I used to be a prof and, and I'm like, okay. Um, so let's talk about that now. <laughs> right? And so, so I think that um, some of the things that you've experienced, um, if labeled differently yeah. and seen for a different lens, you'd understand that part of it is that we're trying to understand and diagnose where you're at and you're learning. And then from there, we then ask the next question because that next question, when you're in that, what we call the zone of proximal development, the space where you're at the edge of what you're comfortable with, with what you know, what you're capable of, mm -hmm. and we push it just a little bit further. That's when the learning happens. Mm -hmm. Of course, what I have to do is also make sure I have the safety net and the trapeze net and like, you know, all the cushions lined up so that when you fall, the patient doesn't get hurt. Exactly. But the idea is that, um, great bespoke teaching may not always feel and look like what you think teaching and learner centeredness is because it sometimes feels uncomfortable. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, now that you're mentioning it, I, I, I do recall a lot of clinical education being very learner centered. So thank you for teaching me that. 